everybody to young adults. We are so glad you guys are here, both in the flesh and online. Hello, everyone joining us online. We are here because we believe that God truly is alive and active and on the move, and we want to learn to live more like his son and love people more like his son, Jesus. So we're glad you guys are here joining us tonight. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Sarah. I get to be the associate director here at Calvary, and I'm really excited to be with you. Before we jump into worship and all the good stuff, we have a few things we want to share with you guys. The first is the opportunity to give. I said this last week, and I've really been thinking more on it, but really, I've never regretted an opportunity to be generous. There's so much tied in with our finances and our spending to our hearts, and it's such a worthy thing to pray about. If that's something that you guys have arrived at with us at Calvary, you can go to calvarywestlake.org, go to the Give button. But again, let's be on this journey together. It's important. It's important to the Lord, and we want to grow together. Next thing is, we're starting something brand new next week called Workspace. And that is going to literally be right here in this patio area. We are going to set up a workspace for you guys. Because just raise your hand if you're working virtual or you're doing school online. All right. Me too. Both, actually. And we recognize that it's nice to get out of your house. It's nice to see people who maybe aren't your family and roommates. No offense, family and roommates. Um, and we want to create a peaceful workspace for you guys with strong Wi-Fi, snacks, shade, a good playlist. Um, there's going to be a quiet space. There's going to be a space if you want to sit at a table with other people. Everything's going to be clean and socially distanced. So you guys are welcome. That's going to start next Tuesday from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. and kind of run through the fall. We're going to see how it goes, but please come. Please tell your friends and coworkers. We would love to have you here. Our last announcement. Uh, this is really exciting. We're going to do baptisms in person here next week. So we are so pumped. Yeah, give it up for baptisms. Come on. We're so excited to be doing this in person to celebrate people's decisions for Christ. If that's something that you are interested in doing, you've never been baptized and you feel like now is the time, please sign up. Please tell somebody. You can text baptism to the number on the screen. But if you're interested in hearing more or what that would look like, find one of us after service. Find a prayer team member. Talk to a friend. We want to direct you. And if that's something that you think you know someone who'd be interested, go ahead and pass it along. We want to celebrate as a community. You can bring your friends, bring your family. But keep that in mind as we go out through tonight and you go out. Go through your week. Whoa, sorry. Um, all right, now let's get to the good stuff. We're going to head into a time of worship. But before we do that, I want to encourage you with this word from 2 Corinthians 3.18. And it says this, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And join us in worship.
God, you may have uh, not done what we wanted you to do in our past, not opened up doors that we wanted opened, but you've never failed. God, you always do exactly what you want to do. And God, so we, we posture ourselves to that tonight. But we're open to what you have. We want what you want. We want what you have for us. Lord, you open our ears, open our hearts. God, prepare us by your Holy Spirit for what Brian's gonna speak over us tonight. We pray this in your name. Amen. And grab a seat. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Hello. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's so beautiful. It's about to get real hot this weekend. So praise the Lord that we got today before this weekend. Hopefully you have a pool or access to one or sprinklers. That'd be great, too. Um, enjoy it this weekend. I have a son, and he's two and a half, and uh, the sprinklers are so wonderful. And I'm reminded of how wonderful sprinklers are on a hot day. So I just want to encourage you all right now, utilize the sprinklers, okay? Anyone? Yes. Yeah? It's fantastic. It's okay to be childish. It's fantastic. It's okay. We need to play. We need to have fun. Return to those things that bring you joy. For me, it's sprinklers on a hot day, so... I just want to encourage you towards that. All right, tonight um, we are um, continuing, wrapping up our series on rhythm or ruin. And um, we've been talking about these rhythms uh, that lead to health and godliness that are, that are laid out for us by God. And God has put these in his word. He's made it clear in an abundance of ways. Um, even through what we see in popular culture, through scientific study, we see there's, there's good in these things. There's good in them. And these rhythms are a means to avoiding the pitfalls of ruin or of an un unordered life. They're the means to, to, to not being uh, adrift Without, a, without the rock of God's word and Jesus' salvation to anchor our lives to. These rhythms are the tools, like a, like a navigator who has a compass and a sextant, you know, who can find their way. This is what these rhythms are here for us to do, to help us navigate this crazy world, to help us avoid a life of chaos that's just blown in all directions by distractions and desire and whatever else comes our way. We need them. They're for our good. They're for your good. They're tools to bring us into the presence of the Lord and be shaped by him, to be made more like him, to have the fruits of his spirit and the gifts of his spirit manifest in us and among us. And that's what we need, and that's what the world needs. These rhythms are good. They're good. I'm going to recap them real quick. So, Maybe you remember, maybe you were here, maybe you weren't. If you weren't here um, or you need to remember, I'm going to encourage you to go back and listen to some of these. They're available on the podcast. There's also on YouTube. You can find, you can find the past messages. Also, you can just read your Bible. You know, that's also a good option. Uh, dive into the Bible and let the Lord tell you. Um, so the first week of this series, Rhythm or Ruin, Brian Howard called us to the rhythm of Sabbath, of working hard for six days and resting completely on the seventh. If you were here, if you remember, he challenged us to things. And I heard many of you share about the conviction and encouragement of that biblical rhythm of service, of Sabbath, of working hard for six days and resting completely on the seventh. I heard many of you say you were going to commit to things. Did you forget already? Did you? It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay if you did. It's okay. But go back, okay? All right? Go back and listen to those messages. Go back and look at your journal and see what God called you to. See what God stirred in your heart. See what the word of God, the truth of, of that rhythm, the good news of that rhythm, see what you're missing out on and don't abandon it. Go back to it. The second week, the week after that, I shared about the three rules of relational health, the rhythms of healthy relationships. Basically, to be humble, 
to be honest and recognize where you end and another person begins. Then Brian Howard spoke on consumption, reminding us of the biblical encouragement and rhythm of fasting and the truth that you must decide how you will consume the world or the world will consume you. Now again, that week, I remember I heard from so many of you. I heard of the sobering realization that there are various forms of consumption in your life that usurped the place of God. And there were plans. There were plans for many of you to implement something, a practice of fasting in some way. I want to encourage you, it's not too late to go back to that if you haven't, or to pick it back up again if you've dropped it. It's not too late. The spirit, uh, the spiritual gift of self-discipline, it's never too late to embrace it. And two weeks ago, Brian Howard reminded us of the, the communal patterns uh, that God created us for, that we are to have a small group of people that you are known by and responsible to. And I just want to call out the dudes out here. Hey, look, we've, we've, got, we've got small groups, and, and I hope the case is that many of you have people to meet with and walk through life with, that you, you work through the things that are deep and important in life. You open the Bible together, you wrestle. But I just want to challenge you. We have small groups, and very few dudes signed up. So I don't know if that's indicative of, man, you guys are doing great. Wonderful. That, if that's the case, wonderful. But if it's not, if you don't have a place to study the Word of God, to come together, to be mutually encouraged, then and, uh, just sign up, guys. All right? Sign up. Or form one. <laughs> Get together in a way that meets regularly where you pray together, where you open the Word of God and you're mutually encouraged by one another. And then last week, Brian talked about what consumes your mind controls your life. That there are, are strongholds. There are ideas and patterns and thoughts that are contrary to the kingdom of God that need to be dismantled. And that dismantling strongholds begins with the knowledge of God, knowing the expression of God through his word, the Bible, and by taking every thought captive and submitting it to Christ. Now, I recap the series because I know many of you were stirred by the Holy Spirit to respond to these calls to godly rhythm. And I, like you, I, like you, am in need of reminders so that I may be faithful to what I've committed to the Lord. So I just want to remind you, what have you already committed? Go back to it and follow through on it. You know, I often hear people ask, you know, what should I be doing? What is the Lord's will for me? And you know what? The the first place to start is what has he already shown you? Are you faithful with it? Have you been faithful with it? So what has he already shown you? Go back and be faithful to that. Amen? Amen. Wonderful. Um, tonight, our last one that we're talking about is the rhythm of solitude. And, and the rule here is that solitude is the furnace of transformation. Solitude is the furnace of transformation. I believe this one and the others, if you would implement these rhythms in your life, you, you'd be positioning yourself before God, submitting yourself to him, and the transformation, the freedom, the power, the life of Christ in you would just be radical It'd be radical. You know, Brian, Howard, Sarah, Jacob, myself, we we came together and spent time in prayer and then talking and working through what are the rhythms that we need to highlight? What are the rhythms that we collectively, all of us, need to spend some time in? And, And I think these are the most pertinent and applicable ones to our congregation right now. And tonight, as we look at solitude, it's no exception to that, that call that God put, yeah, that it's applicable to us. It's applicable to you. You might be thinking, I've been in quarantine. What are you talking about, man? I don't need to be more alone. Hopefully, it gets revealed as we talk through this. But for Sarah, Brian, and I, the, the Spirit affirmed things in the, in, the, in the unity that we had on this, that, that this is needed. This is needed for us. It is timeless, the need for solitude. We need it as a people. See, solitude is, is uh, a, an essential rhythm of the godly man or woman. And it's often accompanied by silence and rooted in submission. 
And this rhythm is evident in those whose lives just exude the peace and presence of God. You see it in people. You see it as they walk about that they've been with the Lord. Like Moses, when he came down from the mountain and he just glows, like, I don't know, I, I haven't seen anybody actually physically glow, but man, do they, in every other sense. You see the Spirit of God in them and their interactions and their relationships and how they speak and how they carry themselves. And that comes from a place of solitude and prayer and alone time with God. You know, throughout the scripture, we see the people of God, the prophets, the psalmists, the disciples, and Jesus himself retreating to secluded places to be with God, to be alone in prayer with the Father, with God. You know, my own life, I, I can speak out of this saying that I have been shaped dramatically by seclusion with Christ. There's a, there's a, direct, a direct correlation between the, the most transformational moments or seasons in my life and a rhythm of solitude. And that transformation wasn't just spiritual. That transformation was my whole self. I can see it and other people could see it in me and they'd call it out and I'd be like, praise the Lord. <laughs> My view and perspective on people, my view and perspective on life and sin and society, all of it would be shifted. Because as uh, you are removed from all of those things, it, it's, it's a spinning up of the potter's wheel and letting the careful hands of God go to work, reshaping us and attuning our vision of ourselves and all that surrounds us to God's vision of it. For me, this rhythm of solitude, guys, I like, I have two kids that are young and awesome, but also require some attention. And it's great, but also it does make it hard. There's demands in life. There's ministry. There's, there's, so, there's so many other things that, that call us away from our time with the Lord. And I got to be honest before all of you right now, this is the solitude and the last seasons have has been hard for me. I've been out of practice with it for some time. I which I praise the Lord that this is the one that I got the ticket pulled <laughs> to preach on. Because the Lord knows I needed to, to wrestle through this these last few weeks. I need it. Not just now, but I need to continue to do so. I've known a need for, for solitude. I have felt it over these past seasons and I felt the, the unsettling of my soul. I've, I've actually observed the tangible disordering of work God had done in me in past years. It's discouraging. It's heartbreaking. And in moments of frustration or disappointment uh, uh, with myself or with circumstances, I... I I guess I just imagined myself retreating rather than actually doing it. I long for it and then distract myself from it. I say, oh, if only. What's on TV? <laughs> oh, if only I could, I could just be alone with the Lord. What's new in the news? I've even done it at times. I've done it quite a few times over this season. You know, I'm a pastor. I've got to practice what I preach, right? So I try. And at various times, in various ways, uh, I've done this, but somehow been disappointed or discouraged by the experience. Not every time, but there's been a consistent thread of that. Maybe that sounds familiar for some of you. Maybe it doesn't for your own experience. But in preparing for this message, I've Return to a book that was given to me when I was 18 years old by Pastor Kirk DeWitt. Some of you know who he is. Uh, a book which shaped my, my practice of solitude and the rhythms I had with the Lord. Uh, it's called The Way of the Heart by Henry Nouwen. And i got to be honest, I never read the whole thing. <laughs> I just read part of it. But man, it still shaped me. Shaped how I walked with the Lord. And, and in returning to it, I have recently uh, read all of it. It's short, so it's easy to do. And it's so helpful to return to those things, those places, those, 
Ebenezer's, those landmarks where we've seen God move, where he's, he's shown us something, he's led us to something. It's so good to return back to those places, those waters, and be refreshed and reminded. And so over this time, that's what it's been for me. In returning to that, I, I've been made aware again of, of, of the process of solitude. See, there's refreshing solitude, refreshing solitude. And, and that's, uh, I think, what we often seek. But then there's transforming solitude. And when I reflect back on some of my recent voyages into solitary places, I see that my disappointment relates to my expectation for refreshing solitude. I come expecting that. When what I needed first was transforming solitude. Refreshing solitude is what we seek when we desire solitude. Most of that's for me, that's the case. And I think for most people, that's the case. And we seek it because, because we need it. Because we need to be refreshed. You know, in Mark 6, we read about the apostles coming back from having been sent out to preach the good news of the kingdom. And in Mark uh, 6, verse 30, it, it picks up right here. It says this. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. They had just been out traveling about teaching and healing, a ministry that, that demanded a lot of them. So they come back to Jesus and, and they report to him all that's going on. Verse 31. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, that's Jesus, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. My friends, every time, every time we respond to these words of Jesus, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. There's power. It may not look the way you think it should, the way you wanted it to, but there's power. See a key component here. Notice he says, come with me. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. Every time you retreat from the hustle and bustle and distraction and noise, my friends, cherish Jesus' invitation to spend this time in his company. Cherish that invitation. As you drive home tonight, as you lay in bed before falling asleep, when you take that 15-minute shower, even as you sit on the toilet, okay? Even as you sit on the toilet. Chris, so recently I had a conversation with Chris where he reminded me of a sermon where the preacher called everyone out. Like just totally called everyone out. And he's like, he's, you, you, you say you don't have time for Jesus. You say you don't have time for Jesus. Yet every moment of solitude you have is filled with distraction. Even hunting for your phone because you can't bear the thought of sitting on the toilet without it for 10 minutes. Man, there's invitations all around us, even in awkward places. Jesus isn't ashamed. Neither should we be. <laughs> He's with us always. When you have the opportunity to retreat, cherish the invitation of Jesus to spend that time in his company. So Jesus says to his disciples, right, come with me to a quiet place and get some rest. And, and actually the story after that gets, it kind of doesn't really work out. Um, I suggest going back and reading it and, and reading uh, the story of the fishes and loaves that precedes this, or precedes, follows? Follows. That this precedes, that's the way to say it. Uh, because it's enlightening to recognize these guys need a rest and Jesus wanted rest for them, but then people came and they served them. And the way they served them, it's beautiful. But what we see here is that uh, the apostles had come back to Jesus after being sent out by him on their mission of teaching and healing. And they were eager to share the stories, but they needed time out. And Jesus needed time out too, to rest and be restored in the presence of the Father. So Jesus allowed the crowds to surround him and draw comfort from him, but to refresh his own strength, he retreated alone into communion with his heavenly Father. And that's that refreshing solitude we all long for that so many of us long for, yet the hurdles between us and that refreshment seem insurmountable. They seem ingrained in us as if we can't get past them. Maybe this is true for you. And there's a reason for it. 
There's a reason it's like that. Because when you answer Jesus' invitation to come away to a deserted place and rest a while, you've got to confront the reality. And you've got you've to move into it to not be afraid of being alone by yourself. Fear, rather, the opposite. As Pascal wrote, the sole cause of man's unhappiness is that he does not know how to stay quiet in his room. That's not the sole cause. But there's truth to that. We're so uneasy being alone. So uneasy being secluded. Just us and the Lord because we're afraid to be with ourselves. The biggest hurdle to the refreshment of solitude is the confrontation the confrontation we will experience by being alone with ourselves in God's presence. We see this pattern in Jesus' own life and ministry. Praise the Lord that he was so gracious. He, He didn't do, there's nothing we experience that he didn't model first for us how to go through. In Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, it'll be up on the screens. If you have your Bibles, you can open up there too. Matthew 4, we're gonna be in verses 1 through 11. See, right before this passage that we're about to read, Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan River by John, who, by, on his own, that dude, like, solitude all the time, man. He wore camel's hair and ate locusts. Like, that's, nobody wants to be around that guy. So he's baptized by John in the river, and, and this declaration for heaven comes down that this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And then we pick up in Matthew 4, verse 1. It says this, Jesus was then led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. He said, all this I will give to you if you'll bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Jesus himself entered into the furnace of solitude. Jesus himself walked through it where he was tempted with the three com- compulsions of the world, the things we all are long toward, have a longing towards, a call towards. And that's first to be relevant, to turn stones into bread, to, to live in the desires of the moment. He was hungry. And then it's to be spectacular, to, to throw yourself down to, and show your splendor. And then to be powerful. I'll give you all these kingdoms. And there in that wilderness, in that struggle, Jesus gave us a map. Jesus affirmed God as the only source of his identity. You must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What we see in Jesus' encounter in that solitude is that the place of great, that place of great struggle and and the great encounter, it's both. It's the struggle and the encounter. The struggle against the compulsions of the false self, that those things, the sinful self, selfish desires, and the encounter with the loving God who offers himself as the substance of the new creation, the identifier of identity, they happen in the same place. They happen in that same place. See, solitude is where we die, and a new creation comes about. But we die not only to ourselves, but to this world and to others, what they think of us, what they say about us, how we rank compared to them. We die to all of it, so that all that matters is the Lord. 
our identity, <laughs> all, all the gunk, all the barnacles, all the stuff that is latched on to who we are and how we view ourselves and how we fit in this world, in solitude, in that place, in that battle, it's all scrubbed away. It's chipped away. It's peeled back. And all that matters or is true is what God himself says and sees when he looks at us. See, when looking at Jesus' temptation and knowing that we are not greater than our master, man, is there any other way to know or to see it than that when we enter into a place where we're alone with ourselves and those things that assail us, that haunt us, that attack us, that draw us away from God, it's going to get ugly before it gets pretty. It's going to. This is not an uplifting sermon. Not at this point. But it doesn't end here. It doesn't end here. See, the beauty of solitude with God is truly unmatched. It truly is. But such freedom and life is not free. There is a cost. There was a cost for Jesus. He, a war he had to wage. A war he won. And we are not exempt from the war within ourselves. A war we often run from. The confrontation that ultimately results in transformation that we just, we just can't handle that confrontation. We just don't want to deal with that confrontation. Don't make me do it. I don't want to do it. And all along we're missing out on the transformation God intends. Transforming solitude involves eliminating distractions. God, this is the truth. If you want to be transformed by the Lord, you've got to get alone with him and be truly alone. Get so bored, get so bored that you are left with only yourself, only you, to the point that you are so revealed, so revealed, your thoughts, your hate, your pride, your envy, your struggles, your disappointment, your wandering mind, the, the thoughts and ideas that you grasp for, for comfort and meaning, the lies that you've internalized, those strongholds, as Brian talked about last week, they're all revealed. They're all revealed. And you can't avoid them, and it's ugly. It's ugly, but it's necessary. See, in Romans 12, too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's transformation needed in us. We've got to get down to it, down to that substance so that it can be transformed. We're called into this transformational work. We're called into it. This uprooting of that which is counter to the kingdom of God so that there is room for the spirit that, that is planted in you to grow and flourish. You know, from that book that I mentioned earlier, now and puts it this way. He says, Solitude is not a private therapeutic place. Rather, it is the place of conversion, the place where the old self dies and the new self is born. In solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding. No, no friends to talk with, no, no telephone calls to make, no meetings to attend, no music to distract, just me, just me, naked and vulnerable and weak and sinful and deprived and broken. Nothing. It is this nothingness that I have to face in my solitude. A nothingness so dreadful that everything in me wants to run to my friends, to my work and my distractions so that I can forget my nothingness and, and make myself believe that I am worth something of my own accord. But that's not all. See, as soon as I decide to stay in my solitude, confusing ideas, disturbing images, wild fantasies, weird associations jump about in my mind like monkeys in a banana tree. Anger and greed begin to show their faces. I give long, hostile speeches to my enemies and dream lustful dreams in which I am wealthy, influential, or very attractive, or poor and ugly and in need of immeasurable consolation. Thus, I, I try again to run from the dark abyss of my nothingness and restore my false self in all its vain glory. The wisdom of the desert, or solitude, is that the confrontation with our own frightening nothingness forces us to surrender ourselves totally and unconditionally to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's 
it's a long excer excerpt, I know, but you know, I hope that for some of you it's encouraging, it's reassuring to know that you're not alone in the complex, confusing, discouraging experience of being alone with yourself and God. You know, that's the point, really. Like, God has plans and intentions for you guys, my friends, for all of us. God has plans and intentions for us, for our good, for our happiness, for our blessedness. But that path, the path to truly entering into that means going into the dark places of your soul and lighting them up with the truth and justice of God. This isn't simple, easy stuff. It's hard, it's deep but it's needed. If you want to be a person who truly has an impact on the world, this is the work you need to do. It's scary. It's frightening. It's overwhelming. This seems, this isn't, this isn't entry level stuff, but it's work we all have to do. It's work we all have to deal with. Yourself, man. I'm a mess. I don't like being alone with me. But God does work there. And it's so good. And it's so needed. And I come out better on the other side. Jesus set an example for us in the desert of how to do this. That when you, when you walk this dark road, it's so, so important to have the word of God close by. To have the word of God, even, even hidden in your heart, because with it you can dismantle the strongholds that are revealed and push back against the lies and plots of the enemy that keep you from the transformational encounter with God. The scriptures are so important that, that if we are to make it through this battle, the example that we get from Jesus in his temptations is the word of God. The word of God is the sword with which we cut out of our hearts that which is contrary to the kingdom of God, in which we push back the enemy. And there will be pushback needed. There will be. And there will be transformational piercing of ourselves needed by that same word, that sword. And it's not always going to be pretty because guess what? <laughs> There's some ugliness in there that needs to come out. When you've got a wound, it doesn't heal by ignoring it. It doesn't. A deep wound. I guess some wounds do. I have some wounds that healed with, by ignoring them. There are small ones, though. I guess real deep wounds. I didn't think this one through. <laughs> deep wounds, like truly deep, deep wounds. Like if you've fallen and, and you get like dirt and gunk and all that stuff in there, you got to wash it out. You got to get in there and scrub. You got to dig out that dirt and that junk so that it can actually heal and cover up and the skin can regrow. And it sucks, man. <laughs> like it hurts, it's painful. It's not something we want to do, but we all innately, we get this in our physical sense that we have to do it. You go to the doctor and you get a shot. You don't like it, but you do it. You go to the dentist because you're like, man, I know I should, and it'll be worse if I don't. But for some reason, our spiritual lives and our emotional lives, we ignore this as if we can avoid it, as if we just keep kicking it down the road. We'll never really have to deal with that stuff. And all we're doing is cheating ourselves out of the, the transformation out of the glory, out of the power, out of the beauty that God intends for us. Don't skip it, guys. Don't miss out on it. This is a call to myself as well. These weeks have been good <laughs> and challenging me and reminding me, oh, I got to get back to this, Lord. I need you, I need you to wreck me. <laughs> like, get in there and make me real sad <laughs> so that then you can make me real good. Amen? Man transformation of the substance of who you are requires first getting down to that substance. It inevitably means seeing and revealing things in you that are unflattering because that's most likely what we're distracting ourselves from. It's not usually the best parts of us we avoid, but it's usually the most haunting. I see in myself over these recent struggles with solitude that, that I have sought restful solitude. I've sought that. I've wanted it. I know I need it. And God, when I've asked him, I've said, Lord, bring me, bring me this. And so he's brought me to that trailhead, that trailhead of restfulness, of, of peace within his presence. 
And as I, as I enter into it, I start to encounter thorns and thistles of my own mind. The, the steep switchbacks and dim valleys of my heart. And I have disappointment because it's not easy and refreshing from beginning to end. I give up. Frustrated at God and disappointed in myself. It's a pattern that I have been called to break. To go back to how it was in some senses. And, and fight those dirty fights <laughs> with myself and the Lord by my side. Maybe the same is true for some of you. It's hard. It's frustrating. It's disappointing. But there's good news, my friends. There's good news. There's very good news. Beautiful news. The best news you could ever imagine. And this furnace only makes the news more beautiful. Only more beautiful. That it doesn't end there. The path through the thorns and thistles will give way to great views and meadows so wonderful you'll carry the peace of them with you wherever you go. The true beauty is that such haunting revelation is met by the gracious and loving voice of God. The good news is that he has better things in mind for you. That he forgives and redeems you. In solitude and silence and submission, we see ourselves unveiled and we hear God's compassion-filled words. It isn't a distant voice calling us up to him, but an arm around your shoulder ready to climb with you through that desolate place. He comes with you on it and walks with you through it. If you've put your faith in the power of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, then I encourage you guys, I call you, the Lord calls you to then continue to do so. Continue to put your faith in that power with regular retreats into his loving, transformative hands. Practically, what does that look like? I'll just give a few points. Take time in the morning to sit silently before him. To be quiet. To wake up and reach for nothing else other than him. To open the word, to maybe pick up a journal, and to be quiet with him. Schedule days or hours uh, to flee to quiet places. Go find a place where no one else is and be there. And be there with him for long periods of time. Because sometimes some of this stuff, you know, you got to really work through it. <laughs> it's going to take some time for the Lord to go to work. Make a habit of it. Once a month, I don't know, whatever it is, of fleeing, of going away, being alone. Cherish Jesus' invitation to spend time in his company, even in the small moments throughout the day. This pattern, this rhythm is something that happens in big, long, extended times, but it also happens in the little moments, like even when you're just sitting on the toilet, whatever it is, sit in the shower. What, like there's moments throughout our day as we drive in the car. Like there are so many moments for us to accept Jesus' invitation to be in that moment with him. Then rid yourself of distractions. Rid yourself of distractions and compulsions. Like, like leave the phone in the car. Leave the phone in the car. When you go to bed, don't bring it with you. Don't bring it with you. So that that night as you fall asleep, instead of the last thing you see is, is some, I don't know, anything off of that, rather than it being maybe a word of the Lord that he speaks to you as you fall asleep, or, or scripture that you've memorized that you repeat as you fall asleep. Well, uh, the word of God ought to end our day. And if you don't have your phone with you in the morning, then guess what? Then it makes it that much easier maybe to wake up in the morning and have the word of God start your day as well. And maybe for you, it's not the phone. Maybe you, you've got self-discipline in that way. But whatever it is, if there's something that's going to distract you, remove it. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Like for me personally, I like YouTube, I can get lost in YouTube forever because I love random things and I love learning. And so I'm like, I could just, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. How does the Burj Khalifa not fall down? Like I'll watch like anything and everything because I just enjoy it. I think it's fun, but I've learned that that's, that's a trap for me. And so I don't have the app on my phone and I've blocked it 
between certain times so that I can't distract myself, not because it's taken me to terrible, ugly places, but because it keeps me from beautiful, wonderful things. And so I've just said, you know what? That's not worth it. I don't need to see the latest video from whatever, from whoever. That's for me. Maybe you, it's something else. Maybe it has nothing to do with your phone, but whatever it is, it's not worth it. If it's distracting you from the Lord, if it's distracting you from time with him, from his invitation to be with him. And finally, bring only a Bible journal and a submissive heart, especially if you're going to set time aside like a whole day or, or a weekend or even a few hours. Like, like just, just don't even bring anything else. Just have your Bible and your journal and a submissive heart. And I tell you what, you're going to get bored, <laughs> like, especially if you're doing it for a day or a week. Week, well, that's a real long time, but I know of people who do that. Um, but if it's extended periods of time, like, you're going to have to wrestle through some stuff. But don't give up. And keep coming back to the word. It'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. Solitude is the furnace of transformation. It's the furnace of transformation. And it's a transformation by the hand of God that we and the world around us de desperately, deeply needs. Now, for everyone here, for everyone here, no matter where you stand with Jesus, no matter what you think about Jesus, no matter what you've heard about Jesus, for everyone here, whatever you believe or don't believe, I want you to hear this. Listen up. All your failure, any ounce of shame or disgrace, all the hate you have harbored, all the pain you have caused, all that you have received or suffered under, all of it, there is freedom. There is victory. There is redemption and recovery and hope for you in Jesus. God created you, guys. He created you. He initiated you with love and great joy. He is just. He is just. His justice flows from him and, and justice is defined by him. And, and, and that which is wicked and destructive will be held accountable. It will and my soul, and, and every soul, writhes at the acknowledgement of that truth. That's what makes solitude with him so hard at times, at first. A truth made more obvious in solitude. That pride and anger and hate and lies, abuse, uh, self-centeredness, wickedness, it's more ingrained in me than I have power to deal with on my own. It's more ingrained in you then you have power to deal with on your own. And in solitude, that's made clear to all of us that we're all helpless before it. Yet in Jesus, in Jesus, there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. That abyss gets filled by his love, gets filled by his sacrifice. For God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, for me, for you. Jesus suffered the condemnation due me and you. He willingly died on the cross. God, in the flesh, suffered that you and I might be free. Jesus laid condemned in death in the tomb for three days, then rose from the dead in the triumphant assertion that that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords, that he's in charge, that not even death has authority over him. He's in charge. <laughs> Absolutely and unequivocally. He willingly died on that cross. God in the flesh suffered that you and I might be free. That's beautiful. That's the good news. That's what's on the other side of the thorns and thistles. That's what's in the midst of the thorns and thistles, actually. That Jesus' victory is yours to partake in. It's yours to partake in. It's used to, yours to participate in. There is forgiveness. There is redemption. There is healing. There is recovery. His triumph and life is freely given to you to participate in. It's not thrust upon you. It's not thrust upon anyone. God in his love gives us the choice to receive and partake or to deny 
and to continue on in the life and destiny we deserve. Friends, we all have the choice. You have a choice. It's yours and yours alone. No one else makes it for you. So we have to ask, what is your choice? I have to ask, what is your choice? God offers an opportunity. God offers a solution. God offers a rescue. God offers a vista a view so beautiful, so wonderful that you can't hardly comprehend it. And all you have to do is say, sure, I'm on board. <laughs> to confess that he is Lord and believe that he rose from the dead. You have a choice. To keep running from that dark abyss that you find when you're alone. To keep avoiding it or to go into it and meet the one who can redeem you out of it. Rescue you from it. We all have a choice. You have a choice. Been talking about solitude, right? Nothing like solitude with 300 people. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take some time, a moment, a few moments, 10 moments, 10 minutes, to retreat, to commune, you and the Lord. I want to encourage you to bring that decision, that choice of what you do with Jesus, bring that into this time. It'll be 10 minutes. 10 minutes. For some, that's going to be like super long and agonizing. For others, it'll go quick. But my hope, my hope is that this time of silence will be the first drop of many to fall on a parched, dry, cracked land. A thirsty ground. I pray your soul would drink it in. And that if you see how thirsty your soul is, plan this rhythm of solitude and silence with Christ into your days and weeks. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to the victory in life he has it for you. That he offers to you the forgiveness and freedom that he extends. Say yes to him. So I'm going to pray here in a moment. And then feel free to kind of spread out. You know, we're all kind of close right now. Feel free to spread out. There's lots of space on the grass. There's like a big oak tree back there. You got some time. You know, feel free to spread out. And find, a, find a little space that's all your own. Um, if you're watching online, you know, I don't know, leave the phone uh, or the computer on the bed or the couch, whatever it is, like get on the ground on your knees, just, just whatever it is uh, for all of us to put, put ourselves in a position to close your off for yourself from distractions. Close off from distractions for just a few minutes and hear the still gentle voice of the Lord Almighty, of God Almighty that is here and he is present. So Chris, if you could um, bring up a little bit of like ambient music stuff, otherwise it's going to be awkward when people cough. Cool, thanks. <laughs> so he'll bring up a little bit of noise to actually try and help eliminate distractions here because we're all together. But I pray that this silence that you'll settle in with the Lord for these brief moments. The Lord is waiting for you, my friends. Father God, we abandon ourselves into your hands. May we earnestly say, do with us what you will, what you desire. Lord, whatever you may do, I thank you. Let only your will be done in us, Lord. And in all your people. So now, Lord, without without reserve, with boundless confidence, we come before you. We surrender ourselves to you and you alone, Lord. Be present here.
Amen.
Father is not done speaking to you yet, church. Christ himself in John 8 says this, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, there's two things for us here. There's freedom in the experiencing of truth through the proof of our discipleship. That's the first thing. The second thing is we get that from abiding in the word of God. That is the scripture. That is in listening to him, which is what we're doing. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to continue in what we're doing. That is to abide. So the dictionary actually defines abide. And it's simply this. To abide is to remain, to continue, and to stay. So we are going to remain in solitude with him. As he speaks to us a little bit more, If you don't mind, I'm going to pray. <laughs> Father, I come before you, God, in recognition of the fact that if Jacob would sings your words, Jesus, that I might lead someone astray. But Father, if your son Christ within me speaks your words, there will be no doubt that somebody will encounter you. So Father, would you use me as a mouthpiece? And would you speak to your body right now? you can't know till you're still in the silence let your spinning thoughts slow down in the stillness things have a way of working out allow me to introduce myself again I'm the one that knew you before time began. I've been waiting for you to let me be your friend. Everything you ever need, everything I am, I am, I am. I am Take your chance There's nothing here to lose Ask your question And I promise you the truth Are you resurrecting? I want to hear your heart, oh is it heavy, where wounds have left a mark, allow me to introduce
introduce myself again. I was with you every place you've ever been. I'm the one who held you when you couldn't stand. If you're wondering who can heal your brokenness, I I came, I came. I will meet you in this house upon the hill, how I want to show you I am real. Speak to me now. You have all my attention. I will linger and listen. I can't miss a thing. Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new. So I surrender.
I just want to thank you for that love tonight. That love is stretched out to every single one of us here. Whether we follow you right now or not, you still love us unconditionally, no matter what. I just want to thank you for bringing every single person in this place tonight here. You've brought each and every one of us here tonight specifically for a reason. This exact moment for a reason. You planned it before we were even born. I just thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for every single one of us. I just pray that we would follow that plan, step into that purpose that you have for us because it's wonderful and it's perfect and it's beautiful. I just pray that we would step into that. In your name, amen. Go ahead and take a seat for a moment. The Jesus that we worship, the Jesus that we've been talking about tonight. In Philippians 2, we get a picture of who he is. It says, Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. One day that's coming for all of us. We have an opportunity now. And I left you with a decision, to ponder a decision. For some of you, you've, uh, you've maybe never made a decision regarding Jesus. Maybe you've never known you had one to make. Maybe you already made it in that time. If you chose to follow Jesus, I, there's some next steps. Learn to walk with him and experience the fullness of his life that's available to you in the kingdom of God. That the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus has power for you. Power each and every day. If you made a decision for Jesus in that time, I, I just want to applaud you. I want to say, praise the Lord. I, I applaud you and then I didn't do it. I celebrate you. <laughs> and if you haven't, maybe you're still on the fence. Maybe you're like, I don't know. Now's, now's a chance. <laughs> now's an opportunity. Don't leave without making a decision. Don't leave this one on the shelf. The God of all creation, the one who formed you in, his mother's, in your mother's womb, who brought you to life, who gave you a soul, who gave you a will, who gave you longings and desires, who, who sees the inmost thoughts you have and loves you. He sent his son that you might be reconciled to him, that you might walk with him again, that you might know the freedom and love of your creator. If you haven't made a decision yet for Jesus, now is a time. Choose him. Acknowledge that he, he died for you. That he was buried and laid dead for three days until he was raised from the dead, conquering death once for all, for all of us, for you. Confess that he is Lord with your lips and step into the freedom the joy, the life, the hope that God has in mind for everything and everyone. Will you follow Jesus? Will you open your heart to him, your life to him, and see what the one who created you can do with it? I'm going to pray 
And I invite you to pray alongside me a prayer of confession, a prayer of repentance, a prayer of, a prayer of acknowledgement of who Jesus is and receiving him. And then after that, if you've made a decision for Christ tonight, I'm, I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to call you to, to make a physical uh, response because we want to connect with you. We want to walk with you. And so I'll actually call you to stand up and go meet with somebody. Go talk with somebody. If you made a decision for Jesus, if you're ready to make that decision, now's the, now's the time. You get to join the family from now till eternity. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so let's all bow our heads. Close our eyes and You can pray along with me. And, and if, this is, if this is your confession, if this is your moment of choosing Jesus, whisper these words along with me. God, I have failed. Lord, surely my destruction would be complete if not for your unfailing love. You have offered me life, forgiveness, and redemption. I hope. And I receive that treasure tonight. Believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. And I confess with my lips that Jesus is Lord of all. So God, I'm yours. I'm yours, Lord. Thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Um, if you're a prayer team member or a small group leader, if you could stand up and maybe put your hand up in the air. If you just go like this. You can even shake if you want. Uh, that might be awkward. Um, if, you, if you pray that prayer for the first time tonight, if you've accepted Jesus tonight, we want to walk with you through this. We want to celebrate with you. We want to pray with you. So look around. There's some people standing. We want to walk with you. If you prayed that prayer tonight, get, lock your eyes on one of them and go talk to them. Go talk to them. Next week, we're doing baptisms. That's a, the most public declaration of, of our acceptance of Jesus as Lord, that, that we can declare to the world, unashamed, I am the Lord's. And he is mine. So I want to encourage you to go talk with them and talk with them about baptism. Talk with them about the, starting this life with Jesus. Talk to them about whatever's on your mind and heart and they want to pray with you and walk with you. And we, Sarah and I do. We're gonna, we'll reach out to you. We want to talk with you this week. We, you're not alone and you shouldn't be. You don't need to be. And, and God has such great plans for you. So if you've made a decision for Jesus tonight, go talk with one of them. It's not too late to make the decision either. <laughs> you still got a chance. Go talk with one of them. Talk through it with them. Talk through it with me, Sarah. We're available. We're here. Love you guys. I'm thankful to get to be here with you tonight. I'm thankful to get to serve with you, to worship with you. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. All the power. All the honor, everything, it's all his forever and ever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We'll see you next week.